So a few years ago, I'm at this party in San Francisco, and I meet a student who's just come back from a year at a Vietnamese monastery. It's super cool. And I'm curious about, you know, what is the most Zen thing he's learned? And he tells me this story about dirt. One day, all the apprentices were tasked with moving a truckload from one field to another. Except it turns out Zen masters are not that organized. The monk in charge isn't exactly sure where it's supposed to go. They move it twice after a four-hour job turns into two days. But at the end, the head of the monastery shows up to appraise their work. And he looks around benignly and smiles wisely and says, nice work, you moved the wrong pile. Well, the student's ready to quit. I mean, he's been doing all these pointless work details, and he's there to meditate. And this is a new love, literally moving dirt in circles. But then he notices something. One of the other apprentices is actually smiling. So he asks her, what's the secret? And she tells him. And the answer changes his life. And then it changed mine. And today, I hope to do something for you. Now, I'm a management consultant. I uh, work with teams to help improve productivity. And in recent years, I've become aware that our greatest, well, maybe our greatest productivity challenge is related to what that student felt that day, that sense that his work was meaningless. That's a fear shared by not just many, but most around the world. It's a human tragedy, a huge waste of energy and potential. But the good news is, there's something we can do about it. Something we can start doing today. And it has to do with that conversation between those two young people in that faraway field all those years ago. Now, not long after, I heard a Fortune 500 executive give an interview to suggest that this shouldn't really be a problem because we're living in the golden age of purpose. Now, it's not hard to see what she meant. Today's consumers, we expect brands to have social impact like never before. Even smaller companies have missions and visions. In the last 10 years, we've consumed books and talks about why in record numbers. Pollsters say no generation has ever cared as much about the meaning of work as millennials and Gen Zs. That's not the whole picture. Recently, a consultancy asked 1,000 people if they live their purpose at work. Among senior executives, the answer was overwhelming, 85% yes. But among those representing the other 98% of the workforce, only 15% could agree. That floored me. That's less than one in six of virtually all of us. This may be Purpose's golden age, but mil millions, actually billions, are being left behind. Now, companies care about this for good reason. It's a money pit. A 1% drop in engagement, that's like one out of 100 people just checking out at work, leads to a 5% drop in productivity. Companies have been throwing money at this for years, trying to convince us that our work matters. So why are we still sitting at one in six? Is work really that bad? Or are we doing something wrong? Now, one thing I noticed soon after was that teams trying to find their why are all basically using the same approach, a one-day why workshop based on a best-selling book. But as I talked to my clients and called around, I couldn't find that many satisfied customers. In fact, when I cracked the book, I found it's based on some pretty bold assumptions. First, that we each have one and only one purpose, hardwired into the core of our brains that this was largely formed in our teens and stays with us unchanging throughout life. And that all we need to do to turn it into a guide to action 
is to get it into a sentence. My purpose is to do A so that B happens, and then share that with others. Well, there were no footnotes for this. And when I researched it, I couldn't find a single psychologist who backed any of that up. For starters, there is no core to our brains. All its parts are interdependent. There's no place we can find a home, a specific home, for one why. And next, well, I don't know about you, but my personality and uh, goals weren't fixed in my teens. And neither are anyone else's. And lastly, let's face it, most of us hate writing. We struggle to write good emails, let alone try to get the purpose of life into one statement. Now, I thought I might be missing something, so I called an old friend, an executive at the world's largest employer, Walmart, 2.3 million people. She didn't just confirm my doubts, she multiplied them. Like me, Carissa earned a PhD in social science before going into business. So she suggested we combine forces and try to find an approach that was more practical and more grounded, starting with why we even care about purpose in the first place. Now, one great mystery about humans has long been how we managed to go from a few thousand individuals just trying to survive the savannah 100,000 years ago to a billion strong covering the planet before we had electricity. Intelligence can't explain that. Our hominid rivals, like Neanderthals and Homo erectus, they were also intelligent. What evolutionary biologists have zeroed in on about what made Homo sapiens really different was how we worked together. We didn't just take on specialized roles like hunters and gatherers. Neanderthals did that. We adapted those roles to our group's evolving needs. What made us farmers, builders, explorers was the unique emotional reward we get from having a dynamic impact on others. Now, I know purpose often feels like a mystical force, and our culture kind of reinforces that, something from beyond that comes to us. But it's actually just a basic human need. So what happened? How did we lose that why feeling? Well, a lot of things. But what really hit hard was the Industrial Revolution and what became the foundation of the modern economy. See, by taking complex processes and breaking them up into simpler pieces so that we don't actually end up producing a whole product, we just pass it along. Well, that made us unimaginably productive. Humanity has produced more wealth in the last 250 years than we did in the previous 50,000. But that economic miracle, which has lifted billions out of poverty, has come at a harrowing personal cost. Because few of us impact-loving creatures can actually point to a single product we've made ourselves or truly feel our impact on others. As one Gen Z put it to us, most of us feel like musicians who can't hear ourselves play. And that was our Eureka. Why play an instrument that makes no sound? Why do a job that doesn't seem to make a difference? So we thought, let's stop spending all this time and money trying to convince employees that their employers are impactful. Let's help them feel their impact. Let's build those musicians amps. Now, that's easier said than done. But the teams we worked with came up with some ingenious solutions for better feedback loops. Things like personal dashboards, team dashboards, peer recognition systems. But we needed more than just management solutions. We needed a new individual practice. Now, these why statements very popular, and they might work for you if you're a great writer 
and you only have one Y. But what if you don't? What if that very question, what is my life's purpose, is kind of nonsense? I mean, as the world changes, never stops, as we change, shouldn't our purpose change? What if we thought about purpose instead as a moving target, a match between ourselves and our situations, what we might call self-impact fit? The intersection between what we like to do, what we want to do, what we can do, and what the world wants us to do, what it'll pay us to do. Now align all three, and you might not just have one why, you might have several. And they can last shorter or longer. There's nothing to say they have to be lifelong. It might go for a 40-year fulfilling career. Or you might change careers eight times before you're 40. That's the current average. But the trick here is we can't move all of these circles. Start with needs. Let's start with needs. Luck has a huge role in determining what the world asks from us. Everything from what our educational opportunities have been, to where we live, to where and when we're born. We can't just dream it away, with all respect to Tony Robbins. Nor do we have that much say in what we love doing. If you've ever heard the expression, well, whoever said, if you can't do what you're passionate about, be passionate about what you do, well, clearly, they had never had to move much dirt. But know-how, now that's something we can do something about. So let's go back to Vietnam, our frustrated student and his happy coworker. What she realized that day was that even if moving dirt around in circles wasn't having much impact on the world, it was having another kind of impact on her. She was learning how mismanaged workers feel, how communication breaks down, and specifically that the monk in charge, the foreman, was actually losing his hearing. Now that's not earth shaking, but that's impact. That inspired the student to hang around for the year of his life. That's inspired what we're about to talk about next. That's impact. Now, economists say we have impact, or in their terms, create value, when we solve human problems, no matter how small. And we can't do that without discovering new aspects of reality, developing new skills, new insight, new knowledge. So why did she, why was she able to do that? And he wasn't, the student? She was looking. Let me tell you another story. A friend of mine, Brett, basketball player, 6'4", center for his rec team. For years, they never made it to the playoffs. One day, he hears a TV commentator point out that the NBA is now taking twice as many uh, three-point shots as they did 10 years ago. Discovery. So he starts working on his threes. It's actually a pretty good percentage shot if you're good at it. He starts working on his threes all the time. He moves from center out to forward. That's know-how. And the next season, his team goes to the city finals. Impact. Now, which part of that is his why? All of it. See, we tend to get focused on the highlight real stuff. You know, I got a promotion. I had a you know, pat on the back from a client. I, uh, scored something, in a, scored in a game. But that's just the highlight reel. That tip of the iceberg doesn't happen without the rest of the iceberg. Sometimes we have stunning impact. Other times, we're just working on our own know-how. That's the self-impact piece. And we don't do that without going into discovery mode. Now, that's not hard. That's not unpleasant. That's something that comes naturally. Human beings, we love discovering things. It's what's got us here as a species. It's what most of us do every day without noticing. The key is to notice. 
these three things, the three different speeds of why and the whole why that it forms. Because if we can grasp that, and if we can live that, and we can appreciate that what we figure out at the bottom, we don't need to know where it's going to lead for it to be important. Well, we can be happier and more fulfilled in virtually any job, even shoveling dirt. Now, we may not be able to make that vision of a golden age of purpose a reality for all. Some drudge jobs are just too challenging. But if we can bring this more holistic, this more realistic take on why to work, to approach our jobs as explorers who actually give meaning to what we do, well, we can make purpose real for a lot more than one in six. Now, one of my favorite things about Zen, and I'll leave you with this, is how the teachers like to communicate the ideas and riddles that get stuck in your head. So let me try this one on you. If you really want to find your purpose, don't look for it. Why is not something you can find, because why isn't a thing. Why is a verb, and you're doing it right now. Thank you.